Averill, and I'm joined by my partner Brandon Averill today. Disclaimer, Eric Averill and Brandon Averill are the co-founders of AWM Capital. Due to industry regulations, it's essential to explicitly state that investment or strategies mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you, and you should discuss your specific situation with a qualified, certified financial planner. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of AWM Capital or its affiliates. For more information, visit athleteceo.com. Hey there, Athlete CEO listeners. I'm your host, Eric Averill from Athlete Wealth, and you're listening to the Athlete CEO Podcast. Each week, we aim to bring you world-class interviews with some of the brightest and successful entrepreneurs, athletes, and business minds today, sharing actionable insight on how to get more out of your business, finances, and life. You won't be hearing any vague theory or strategies from us. Our guests have walked the walk and are committed to sharing the best of what they know so you can apply the lessons they've learned. Whether you're an athlete, entrepreneur, or just looking to hear from some crazy successful guests, this podcast is for you. Now enough with the intro, let's dive into today's show. Today's show is a special one for me as I have the privilege to sit down with my longtime mentor and friend, Aaron Klusman. Aaron and I first met in 2001 when Aaron hosted me on my baseball recruiting trip at Arizona State University, where we ended up becoming teammates. It was during our college career that Aaron launched his first company, a clothing company. Aaron then went on to play professional baseball for a few years before launching full-time into the business world. You can describe Aaron as a serial entrepreneur. He has made the bulk of his money over the years specializing in retail real estate development and the restaurant and food and beverage industry. A few notable companies that Aaron has been attached to over the years is Dunkin' Donuts, Zoyo Neighborhood Yogurt, and a beverage company called Neighborhood Initiatives. However, most recently, Aaron has been investing heavily in the media and entertainment industry, where he believes they have developed a proprietary algorithm that mitigates the downside risk while magnifying the upside return in film and music finance. Aaron is also the co-founder and the chairman of New Learning Ventures, a private philanthropic VC fund that invests in educational entrepreneurs that are rethinking and reshaping education specifically in the state of Arizona. Aaron serves on the boards of Grand Canyon University's Colangelo School of Business, Hustle Phoenix, and Acton Academy. Very excited for our audience to be able to learn from Aaron as as he discusses some of the hottest topics around investing in clothing companies, restaurants, and music and film. So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with longtime friend and mentor, Aaron Klusman. Well, Aaron, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, share with us a little bit of your background and your experience. You know, the name of uh, this podcast is Athlete CEO. And uh, once again, here we are with with another athlete. And this is a special uh, interview for me just because uh, obviously our relationship goes back all the way to to when I was 17. And and you were a big part of my story of, of why I ended up at ASU and playing baseball and um, so thank you very much yeah. for taking the time. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it would be fun to start right there at ASU Baseball. Yeah. You know, um, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your baseball career and, you know, growing up, what was your, what was your dream? And yeah, let's start there. No, yeah, no, it was, uh, it's amazing to think. How long has it been? So it's seven, that's yeah, about 16 years. years. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, no. So born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, grew up. Uh, uh, dad was a city of Phoenix fireman. Mom was an office manager at a church. I look back. I mean, I felt like I was driven from an early age. At junior high, I was getting up before school, and we had a little gym in our house, and I'd work out at four o'clock in the morning then. And uh, so it's weird. There's always been a drive. You know, to excel and back then it was I wanted to be the best baseball player in the world. So I went to Brophy High School, a private uh, Jesuit school out here in Phoenix, and uh, was recruited to go to Arizona State and went to ASU and kind of had a uh, up and down career at ASU from red shirting to freshman All American to everything in between. Even got a few at bats and. <laughs> <laughs> 
how to look back on it fondly and learn the time. Nice, nice. One thing that uh, that I remember when we were at ASU is obviously uh, your love for business was apparent yeah. even there. Yeah. And uh, love for branding. Yeah. And, you know, like like most entrepreneurs always try their hand out. One of the first things is clothing. So right. take us through that experience, yeah. you know, and some of the best things you learned from yeah. it. I, I remember some some crazy stories about some credit card, card yeah. fraud and things. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, share that with us. No, I mean, it's easy to look back and see how dots connect, but in the middle of it, you're just kind of going with your gut, but I was bored in class and was always sketching, you know, jeans and hats, and I literally, I think I, I went to the locker room one day, and one of my teammates was like, oh, that's pretty cool, and I'm like, well, did you buy it? <laughs> sure, I'm like, 20 bucks. He's like, sure. So I went and had it made, and he was wearing it, and everyone else saw it and thought it was cool, and just, you know, started getting some reps. And I, I think it was awesome because it was, uh, you're just starting to do, and the tough thing with, you know, college is you're learning is you have no context for application. So it's just, you know, it's information without connection to real life. And so for me, it was, you're actually doing a little business, you know, and it's the lessons learned. And I started to see just a, more of my strengths from personability to, how my brain works, you know, that might've, you know, been struggles in baseball were like really strong fits in the business environment. So I just saw a better fit there and tried to keep exploring that. Yeah. And I mean, it, you still have a, a passion for, for retail, right? Yeah. And for clothing and yeah. branding. What for our listeners out there, athletes, I mean, apparel is something that gets talked yeah. about a lot, right? It, it's one of the things that people try their hand at because yeah. I think we've all fell in love with brains, right? Everybody knows Lululemon and, and the question's always like, I could do this, yeah. right? It's, it's not that difficult. Yeah. I mean, why did Lululemon blow yeah. up? And so maybe talking to our listeners, what, what is the, the, the pull to retail? Yeah. And then what are some of the hurdles that does make it a difficult business? Yeah. Well, that's for, honestly, that's what I struggled with with clothing was an honest assessment of just, do you have anything truly unique? You know, are you a, you know, fashion's fickle. So part of it, it's like, you know, it works today, but are you able to do something that's around for a while? And one thing Lululemon did great is, I mean, they, they, they elevated, you know, a triple stitch versus a double. And then the fabric was a, a proprietary fabric that no one's ever really used. And I feel like they actually had a unique product niche that they owned. They had, a moat around them and then they own the, you know, the technology of, you know, the fabric and they actually had something unique. That's what, um, I think is always a big assessment of really being honest on your value proposition and clothing has always been interesting because one it's, it's, it's self-expression to probably the most accurate point. Everyone's unique. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've always been kind of intrigued by, people being true to themselves and their uniqueness and not trying to be like everybody else and fashion is kind of an expression of that, whether it's, you know, one guy is, wears a shirt on top, another guy, you know, wears a baseball belt as a belt. I don't know. There's just like, all guys always have this little unique way of adding their own, you know, flavor and stuff. And I always like that about clothing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Cool. So, after college career, you get an opportunity to go yeah. play professional baseball. You're in the, yeah. the Dodgers organization yeah. and, you know, it seems like you played for a couple of years, but there was always that bug and that passion yeah. to be an entrepreneur. And as we know, as athletes, it's, it's one of the hardest transitions, yeah. right? Whether you've made a hundred million dollars or you've made no money, right. um, something that you've done your entire life, that, that chapter is coming to a close. And how do you take everything that you have learned of being an athlete, the work ethic of waking up at four in the morning and working yeah. out and, and all of those, you know, skills for you, what was that transition like? Was it, you had this clear vision yeah. of what you wanted to do and all these doors opened up for you or, you know, tell us our story, how you became the, the just another minor league baseball yeah. player to, now a very successful kind of serial entrepreneur. How does that happen? No, I mean, the transition's hard, I think, for athletes because the, pr 
pro athletes elevated to such a an elevated state you really whether you think it or not since it a young age, you've been the baseball player, you've been a great football player. So you've always been, you know, when someone mentioned Aaron Klusman, it was always in the context of, oh, he's, you know, he's a great pitcher. And so your identity gets so hinged on that, that when you're done, you struggle with your, just your value in the world. And the reality is, is I think it's hard because you're kind of the center of this bigger culture of your family, everyone's proud of you, your friends and all that stuff, and now you're done and you kind of get this snapshot that the world likes the idea of the athlete, hmm. you know? It's not, and that's, the next guy fills that role. So part of it is you're done and fans keep going and, you know, they love the idea of the athlete or the role of the athlete, the individual is kind of interchangeable. So it's, wow. I think, a big, that stuff, a lot of guys just, um, I think that makes it really hard. So yeah, I mean, it was difficult. I mean, my, my wife swears to me the day I was released from the doctors, I was walking out with a smile. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was hard. I mean, you're like, literally what, this has been a quarter of a century of your life. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's like a mini, I literally tell guys, it's like a mini midlife crisis. Like you Absolutely. just experience it. You know, most business guys face it 50, 60 years old and they're being faced with some of those realities of like, the world really doesn't care that much about you. It moves on. Um, luckily, I think it's an opportunity. I think athletes can face that sooner and just be way more better prepared for the reality of life because they kind of they have to process that way sooner in a career. Right. Um, but yeah, it's hard, um, especially. I mean, the reality is, the later you go in your career, you know, you're great in a space, and then when you start in a world, you realize actually now you're behind because other guys have started a career and you know been laying foundational you know work while um, it's not gonna be difficult yeah. yeah and and we'll get back to more of your specific story of, of how you launched into this i think you uh, i love the story of you literally baked your way into kind of hanging around yeah. some successful guys that, that forced your your foot in the door but maybe talk a little bit about specifically for, for the athlete or yeah. maybe a founder who's had a liquidity event that um, just because you're showing up with money yeah. doesn't, um, doesn't earn you right at the table. Yeah. Or even, as you would said, uh, just because you've excelled and been one of the best in a very specific niche in the world, that that success doesn't equally translate yeah. in, in that it's really a different ballgame, yeah. you know. Share maybe some stories of situations where you've maybe dealt with with some athletes that have tried to walk into this to this world. What's some of the advice that you would give them? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I would tell my kids, I think, getting to the first part of your question is, my son wanted to be said, I want to be the best baseball player. I want to be good at business. I literally, I think, the biggest thing I would tell them is beg, borrow, and steal to train alongside an all-star, you know, push paper, be around a business guy to hear how he thinks and processes information. Cause that's one thing I saw, I was really honest about baseball guys with differentiates professional hall of fame all-stars versus guys that don't make it. The skills are all there, the raw inputs. It's between the years, how the information is processed is what differentiates a hall of famer, you know, versus a guy that, you know, gets a cup of coffee in the bigs and goes home. And I think it's no different in business. It's no different in any space. You can only learn so much from books hmm. and your own reps. So part of it is you have to have access to exponential lift of thought process. So thankfully I look back and it feels smart. Like it kind of orchestrated. It was literally just, you know, um, God was working in great ways in my life though. I think where it was just, he knew what the plan was, but it was um, this underwriting gut instinct of like the environment's more important than the paycheck, wow. you know? And so I think it was just, I knew, give me a good environment, I know I'm capable of it. And so I think looking back, it was just you, you beg, borrow, and steal to get in the right environment around the right talent. And then you just, you know, in time, inside what you're capable of, you just need the right soil for that to, yeah, yeah they bear fruit. Yeah. Pull a, apart a little bit more what you said, the environment's yeah. more important than the paycheck. Yeah. 
and that can be really hard, especially when you're maybe a little bit older, yeah. especially if you have your wife and you have yeah. kids and that type of stuff. But expand on on how important that is, and and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I uh, it's kind of a question: Do you take a sure thing that maybe pays well that you know? I mean, it's a typical choice. Do you you've got a good opportunity? You don't think it's the right fit, but it pays more or you have this opportunity that you know deep down is what you really want to do, but it may not have a sense of like how it gets monetized yet. Yeah. And most people, I think are driven by a fear or a sense that money defines more success and almost rather become, you know, the proverbial attorney that makes a great living and has a cool house, but they're dead inside because it just, you know, they never really wanted to do that. Yeah rather than the guy who's out doing what he loves to do, you know, usually ends up figuring out how to make money at it. And usually it can be somewhat sizable. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, a uh, environments, everything, the right partners. Like I think it was the big thing I was drawn to early on was, um, guys that had a sense of balance in their life, value family time, faith was a component work that it wasn't just, I'm going to make, money at all costs. And so, you know, the wisdom of seeing through some of that stuff, I think is really key um, and who you choose as business partners. And if they're a schmuck, it will eventually show up. I yeah. mean, it just always does. So you really do search out what's their goals and drivers and make sure they're aligned because if they're misaligned, you're gonna have partnership issues big time. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about probably, you know, here in Phoenix, when you first entered yeah. into this world, yeah. um, it's no secret that, that Phoenix is real estate heavy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's our industry. Um, 2008 happens yeah. and the market just gets crushed. Yeah. Talk to me about what that experience has, has been like yeah. over the last decade watching Phoenix transform and and just even you navigating, I know we can talk maybe a little bit about it. you guys have this huge idea uh, with IPO solutions right, right yeah. before the market. You yeah. guys are, um, I think it was the film department, yeah. right? So you, you're you making these big strategic moves yeah. and the market crashes. Yeah. Walk me through that. What were the learning lessons? What was the hardest part yeah. of the, the downturn? And, you know, being able to kind of look back, what were some of the positives? No, I think a big learning is, is you think – going in, you're more an independent cog that can drive, you know, value or loss. And you do realize that, but I think it was going through that was learning. You're on a big wave that, that, you know, you're not as smart as you think when it's going up and, and you can't do anything to get out of the way when it's being reset. I mean, 2008, that knife was falling and every business under the sun was affected by it and, and you kind of, um, so you're just not as, you're smart, you're trying to apply good logic, but you're, I think to see that you're benefactors of a bigger system at times of, of headwinds and tailwinds and to be more astute on, you know, the film thing's a great example. I mean, we got caught, the film department, they executed business plan perfect. It literally, you know, right into the teeth of a liquidity crunch. They couldn't get any of their films out, but they were doing great. So part of it was, it was just like, catch the wrong side of a market, still investing in the space, you know, lose a little, invest again, lose a little, and now seeing equity environments loosen up enough now that we're all of a sudden, you know, money's capital starting to flow into that space and it's more liquid and you're seeing opportunities that five years ago wouldn't have gotten funded. Now all of a sudden are getting funded, doing great. And so just the capital hand behind the economic system, I think is just seen like Phoenix. I mean, it was, I've been blown away how fast. <laughs> I mean, a friend said, you'd be better served to literally when the market was falling and like pack up and go, go to a different country for five years. Let the market reset, let the bank sell off all the debt. You'd be better served to not wake up and stare at the market for the next five years, come back in with fresh eyes, start buying. And literally it was just like that. It's like, the, you know, all the big reset buttons get hit. And then when it comes back, man, it comes back just as quick with a vengeance, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's, 
It is crazy. And I think that just talking about the, I guess the psyche of the investor, yeah. you know, I think uh, the space in which you play right in the, in the VC, you know, private equity world where, where we talk a lot with our own clients about alternative investing yeah. is, um, especially now in this market where, where returns have been so yeah. good for a while that, you know, talking to a lot of our younger investors, they, they don't even know about 2008. Right. right. So, so risk is just, um, it's just a word. Yeah. It's not really on paper. And when we start to talk about the amount of risk, talk, I guess, about what type of emotion it takes to yeah. play the game that you're playing, the importance of liquidity. Um, what advice would you yeah. give to someone who, is, you know, wants to get in this space, but they've never been yeah. in it, especially on, you know, the athlete, we're reading articles now, of, um, a lot of players are investing into the yeah. venture capital world. Yeah. What advice do you have yeah. for them? Well, it's crazy. I mean, even VC, I heard some stat, if you remove Google, Facebook, and like one other one from the past 10 years of VC investment, the return yields are horrible. So it's like, you, you have to know that the VC is a degree of prudent speculation in their model that these guys make lots of, you know, lots of bets spread over a lot of companies that, um, you know, and they've had some hits and the hits are so massive that, you know, their little sprinkles of investments are a million bucks, you know, they have ways of mitigating their own risk along the way. So they'll do a C round and then they'll do a, you know, a, you know, A round, B round, and they'll follow it as risk gets mitigated. But yeah, so to me, risk mitigated returns huge because you'll sometimes find yourself, you know, it's a 10% return, yet you're taking more risk than 10% would really warrant. Or you're getting a 25% return on what should be like an 8% risk profile. And, you, and so to me, the risk you're taking for the return is a really big component. And a lot of guys will find themselves taking multiple type return risk, like, you know, 20% chance it works, you know, yet they're only getting X upside. I wouldn't take, you know, I wouldn't take that trade. Yeah. So I think a lot of it's just realizing in business, you know, idea is great and you got to execute it. Then you got to hold, I mean, in, in this competitive market, you got to stay at the front, speed to market's big. So you could be first to market, start to uncover this really amazing opportunity and know that there's tons of capital sitting, waiting for like, oh shoot, there's like, it's like Lyft and Uber. Uber got to it, it's interesting to watch it because Lyft is kind of second to market. And a lot of guys, the whole venture strategy is they like to be that quick second guy because the reverse guy takes tons of risk proving a niche and then they just load up on capital and all of a sudden you'll see a company just blow past the first to market guy so then it's like not only idea validation you know first to market holding your position and can you hold it you know all the way through to when you actually recoup an investment and you just realize like it's operational risk it's you know general market condition risk, it's timing risk. And so there's a component of like operating businesses, massively illiquid, just know that a lot of things have to line up. But a lot of people just say, well, then don't invest. But part of it is just invest prudently and don't go all in. Because you also want to go that never takes any risk and you, you miss them. But know that you may have to invest in 10 companies, yeah. you know, to get to the one that all of a sudden has some decent return and everyone vitamin water, you name it, there's <laughs> ones that get the press and they're like, Oh, that's going to be, and you know, you just have to know the odds and invest yeah. prudently. But I think you should also be present and be in the mix when it shows up. Yeah. You talk, you know, with your experience being um, an investor, yeah. you've, you've kind of dipped your toes in a lot of yeah. different areas, right? Yeah. From real estate, to restaurants, to food and beverage, to, to now kind of private education, yeah. um, land, you know, you, you've been all yeah. over the board. How do you determine where you see opportunity? Yeah. And when you start to talk about um, risk and return, what type of returns start to compel you to yeah. move into that space? You know, what, what really yeah. is an opportunity? Yeah. Because if we're talking, 
you know, a lot of what we try to educate our clients on is, to your point, we, we love the alternative space being a portion of yeah. the portfolio, yeah. but it has to warrant the Ill, yeah. illiquidity premium. Yeah. So what type of returns are we talking get you interested? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple. Of, I mean, it's in. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm probably a little bit like a Warren Buffett that when you see these private equity funds, it's you know having been on the side of a of a promote, yeah. meaning a sweat equity guy. You got to remember they're trying to underwrite as call it what it is. They're trying to keep as much of the deal as possible and give capital the minimum needed to underwrite the risk profile to get $30 in the door. So most private equity funds, you know, they try and aim for like, you know, mid twenties returns where I'm like, I'm like, you know, but, but they're getting, if it works, they're getting, you know, 30 X on, on their share. And then there's definitely like a lid where I'm like the risk profile for that, I feel is, is miscued. It's almost like I would rather go direct and you know get as close to a company so that you can get as much of that multiple left and i think in a fun approach they're trying to spread it out you know to try and not have a one bad one take it down so i'm probably a little skewed in that sense well, of yeah i think this is an important point yeah. though right because by the time the majority of opportunities have hit the locker room yeah. or the water cooler yeah. or the cocktail party yeah. um or they're being brought to yeah. you by your your financial advisor at one of the big brokerage yeah. firms. I mean, talk about how yeah. these funds are constructed, the fees, the yeah. really the lack of opportunity, and and maybe expand on that yeah. and the difference of going direct. Yeah. And okay, if you say direct's the right thing, how important is it? How do you get access? Right. More times than not, but I would think the athlete should know that that. I'd be slightly skeptical. They're a professional athlete, so they're focused in a space that's very outside of a typical marketplace. So just odds are they're, they're, I would always be skeptical of being dumb money, just, you know, because you're seeing a lot of stuff. But also the reality is, is there could be really good opportunity too. So it's also just knowing that like, the athlete has specialized their whole life in a space that, you know, they hit a baseball or throw a baseball or, you know, throw a football, not understand business opportunities or flip over tons of deals and start to understand risk profiles. So they don't have, by nature, they don't have good um, reps in that space like they would as an athlete. Just like if a business guy came and said, I can hit a 95 mile an hour fastball. The reality is like, no, you're not change the speed on you and you're done or, you know, have a little movement. It's kind of the same thing in business. I think is just to know that the athlete tends to think because they're great in a sport that they're just like, you know, great in all realms. And that's just, that's our pride where it gets the best of us. And I think to be humble, to just be like, you know what, I'm good in this space. If I'm going to invest in this space, I'm going to pick up the phone and call three people that I know kick ass and, tech and get their feedback and have you know some wise counsel around to kind of run some pre-checks they at least get some guys that are used to that industry to guard from big misses and then as it keeps getting green lights then you keep knowing like okay okay i'm gonna you know keep processing it and then just i'm kind of an outliers kind of guy like the odds are okay, i struggle with tech in phoenix because we're not a great tech culture because you wonder, okay, you got a great idea, but we're kind of like two years behind San Francisco. So is there already a guy two years ahead of the curve yeah. in San Francisco that's in the melting pot of resource and capital that, you know, has already been two years ahead of it? And just to kind of know the, the reality of just the math of probability and, and I think it just helps your decision-making process. Not to say like, oh, it, it's not a possibility. It's just keep running it through filters. And um, yeah. I mean, Buffett's brilliant because he just get he hates Wall Street and he hates investment banks and he won't buy companies from investment bankers because it's he knows the game and the game is, you know, 
capital takes a lot of risk. It's just go park it in S and P and, and, He's got that bet going, you know, with hedge fund managers that by the time you net out fees, you know, they hit it big, they take big promotes on the upside, you know, and it gets narrowed on the downside. By the time you net all that stuff out, you're kind of the same. And so I think just to know that all those things really help in a decision making process, you know, as you assess deals and um, make sure you're for the risk you're taking, you're getting warranted upside and, you know, in my world, I feel like it's like a portfolio. You got your fixed income stuff, you know, privately, it's very common to find smart people where you can get, you know, I feel like 10, 12% private returns and good with good talented people with some access seems pretty common. And if you're starting to get into this riskier bucket, it should be multiple type return things if you're going to go because the odds are kind of working against you. So I feel like it's sprinkle a little bit there but yeah you may catch something great and um, you want to make sure if you do it's not like oh i just got 25 percent. you know you should get four times your debt <laughs> right you know i feel yeah. like personally yeah. no that's that's super helpful <laughs> i mean uh, transition into where you're spending a little bit of time now or a bulk of it is it, you're in that you're still in the media and entertainment yeah. space and i think one thing that i was reading is uh, it seems like you guys have develop this predictive algorithm um, with kind of what we talked about yeah. mitigating downside risk and hopefully capturing maximizing returns yeah. obviously i know you can't give away yeah. your your algorithm yeah. here but talk to me about that space it's super interesting because it's another area that we see is sexy yeah um especially we're in la we're in new york um we're thinking media yeah. and we're thinking movies yet it kind of seems like a rigged game yeah. and you're having success yeah. Well, the, the good rule of thumb, I feel like, is the sexier the space, the, the dumber the cap, the more things get funded that shouldn't. So it's like a sports team. It's like a, the less there is on the math, the more there is on, like, I want to be able to say I own part of the Arizona Diamondbacks, or I want to be able to say I invested in a restaurant. You know, the <laughs> things that are, like, the sexiest tend to things you get invested in that always shouldn't. Um, I'm intrigued by the space just because as our economy shifts, you know, creation of content is like the new frontier. I mean, Starbucks is trying to figure out how to create content. Instagram's figuring out how to get into film. Netflix, Hulu, anybody with eyeballs is figuring out how, because content, it's unique, it's one of a kind, and it's the purest venture capital type return space I found with, I feel like way less risk than like, I don't know, I'm intrigued by the, the downside protections and the upside opportunity. So in film, I mean, guys that get access to film stuff is just distribution's key. So, I mean, typical dumb money, funds a film, they get it done and they have no way to get it out to anybody. And so the, the old world, you know, there's a little pond that six studios have controlled, no one can get in and they've controlled the distribution outlets. Luckily, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon are starting to democratize that and give more people access. But what happens is the, the production equity comes in, it's funded, they have no leverage now because they're stuck, they can't get it out, and then they come to a distributor that's like, great, love your film, we're gonna take half of it. And you know, it's a capital stack, and then they get layered in, and then they go put 20 million of print and advertising debt to go market the film. Now that's on top of them. And so when you follow these waterfall stacks of, of film, production equity is like the, the dumbest slot in the world because you know you got your hackers get paid off the top. Well, when your theaters get paid, so you got to remember like domestic box office, your theaters are getting a big cut, then your distributor, your actors, and your distribution company, and then distribution companies, you know, some of them are pretty bad. So part of it is they reconcile quarterly and they just literally, there's bad companies that you have to sue them to get paid. Oh, it's terrible. So they sit on your fund. So part of it, it's not even getting paid, it's getting paid timely, making sure it's accurate, you know, because there's layers of fees and all that stuff. And then hopefully if you crush it, production equity gets returned. So Hollywood's always been broken on the production equity side. I've been intrigued in this kind of mez equity uh, 
there's just a lot of ways to mitigate risk. So there's, you know, and it behaves a lot like real estate. Before you shoot a film, you have a script, you get a cast, you secure your talent. You know, there's A tier, B tier, C tier talent. So A tier has a certain their commodity. So Morgan Freeman has a certain value overseas. Marky Mark has a, you know, uh, Mark Wahlberg has a certain, you know, marketability overseas and then there's B tier, C tier. So yeah, there's, you, you can pre-sell with tax credits. There's ways to contractually cover your production costs before you start filming. So a good, a good rule of thumb is, you know, sell off a lot of your foreign stuff and your tax credits and secure your tax credits to cover your, your, to get to zero and then you play for your upside kind of in North America. So there's, there's good companies with good disciplines, um, but a lot of these big studios, they roll the dice. It's like 30 million on this. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a crapshoot a little bit on, you know, something just doesn't work or doesn't fire right. And they don't yeah. respond right. So it's, uh, yeah, once again, just there's, and I think the, in any industry, when you find, find the best and brightest, and then always try and mitigate downside. It's your, it's your risk mitigator return that's important because anyone can see upside, but they just really don't try and change the risk profile on the downside. And I think you start with trying to create a spread or an opportunity of, of risk level you're taking relative to your upside opportunity. And that's where investment opportunity, I think, shows up. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned something that, that content is king. You yeah. Know, we, we've heard that for a very long time, but, uh, social media has proven yeah. that yeah. Instagram, YouTube, yeah. um, obviously Facebook, your Netflix are yeah. coming online with all their own studios. Yeah. Uh, talk to the athlete and, and this is kind of your combination, your love for yeah. branding. Yeah. There's always been this conversation that an athlete, could become their own media yeah. company, right? Yeah. And monetize yeah. themselves. Yeah. And, you know, we're seeing LeBron James do it in a very unique way with yeah. Uninterrupted or the Players' Tribune, which was, you know, kind of Derek Jeter. If you were a current player that had a desire yeah. to make themselves an attractive investor, would you spend time doing that? Would you, how would you look at your own career yeah. if you knew? Not even that, hey, my career is going to be over tomorrow, but, you know, I plan on being an all-star, but maybe yeah. I'm going to be out of the game in 15 years right. or 10 years. How would you treat your career as a business while you're playing? Yeah, I think just starting to think of yourself as your own brand is probably a good uh, key step. And so each thing that you put your name to, you know, further defines your brand. So you take, you know, the typical athlete that does, you know, the local plumber commercial. I mean, it might be a good quick little fix. It's like Shaq on Icy Hot or something. I mean, I'm like a little bit like, I don't know if that's like furthers the brand equity or now starts to dilute. So each move you make definitely either augments or detracts from some degree of brand equity for an individual. Um, there is a legitimate um window of time to kind of have you know some monetization i think knowing that that you know the world forgets really fast so you do have a kind of a set window to be strategic and it's kind of really rare for guys to stay in front or relevant i mean it's rare even in music i mean madonna is such an outlier yeah. or you know lebron's a, a total freak of an outlier i mean these are like freaky outlier performance. I mean, the average big league guy, I think just know where you're at and know your role and know where you drive value and also be true to yourself because that could be where your brand, that's a big, it's just, humanly speaking, I'm a big believer in be true to who you are uniquely. That's your greatest asset rather than trying to be like, oh, I want to be like them because then you put your, you know, your quirkiness, your weirdness, maybe your, you know, greatest little niche yeah. to add some value. Uh, don't think of it as a liability. Uh, Spend some time there. How, how did you go through that process? How do you, how do you kind of stay true to yourself? What are maybe some tools or resources yeah. or, or learning experiences yeah. that 
that somebody can use to truly try and hone in on yeah. that? Well, they, they would say any studies on success, curiosity, lifelong learner. It's why I've become just such a proponent of education because I'm like, dude, if I could have some of these inputs when I was six, like game over rather than figuring it out at like early <laughs> yeah. 30s, yeah. you know, real time. Um, no, be curious. I mean, just there's a any Michael Jordan was curious about the sport. He, he perfected a craft. Tiger Woods, you name it. There's a just a perpetual curiosity to get better. Uh, be curious about life. Ask great questions. Love learning. I mean, just read a ton of books. Read about uh, podcasts. You name. It. I think there's just a Fail cheap, fail fast, fail often. I mean, that's a big thing. I think in, in business stuff, I always want to keep, I'm probably in different industries because I align with some common cores and then they have some different deals. But I also, I, I just kind of want to keep learning. It's not as much about go make a go start a restaurant and learn a bazillion dollars. A little bit of it is, I don't know if that season I learned some things that are massively valuable now in my real estate piece on how I underwrite or invest in or, you know, do concepts. Um, so to not to, th I mean, it's just, I think just almost, you know, flip over cards. Like you don't know until you start trying stuff, but just yeah. do it, you know, fail cheap. Don't go big and go all in and, you know, burn through a life's worth of careers worth of cash because you, you can't reset, but it's learn a space, invest somebody, you just can't learn it enough until you invest in it. And right. you start getting real data on, oh my gosh, this restaurant is totally failing. And you know, what do we do? But you're, it's not, you know, there's learnings there and it's valuable. So whether it, it works or not. Um, what, what would you say just in your own career, in, you know, to, to your comfort level of sharing, is there, is there a big loss yeah. in your experience that you're like, man, that that hurt, but wow, did I learn from it? And what are some of those lessons? Oh yeah, I mean, one restaurant in particular, I lost half a million bucks fast, and it was frightening. I mean, it was frightening. I never lost monthly cash like that before, um, and and even in. And I remember thinking, trying to like not lose your mind in the middle of it, like, okay, this, you know, this too shall pass. You're going to learn something from it. You'll look back and be grateful. And yeah, even quickly afterwards, I'm like, man, I am so thankful because I learned some fundamental disciplines about a restaurant space that I was like, you're either, you know, that I aligned with me, like, you're either really passionate about this, or I learned some things about the risk profile that I'm like, this isn't for me. And I'm glad I learned that quick. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I'm almost trying to, a little bit of the metrics of keeping track of some losses. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting more active now, but I, I want to keep learning. And so, like, the film stuff's great. I mean, it hasn't panned out fully yet. I mean, Flushed the first round of investment. Luckily, it was kind of small, but it was big at the time. Second round, maybe we'll get there and recoup it. But it gave me a lot of information to where I'm literally like, I feel like the timing's right, and I've gone really deep. That I hope I'm right. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, those kind of have been two losses. So I, it's I'm learning the space experientially. I'm not running from it. I think there's a the industry is real, and I think um, um, you know everyone is in a real time narrative. No one's not a one time failure. I mean, I think Hershey's chocolate. I mean, I, I it told me a lot about. Um, I think you filed for bankruptcy two or three times before oh. you hit Hershey's chocolate, which was literally. I mean, if you could start a Hershey's chocolate <laughs> size company, yeah. I'd say you've done pretty good. But if I was his partner in the first failure. I'd be like, eh, this guy's not that great at business. Yeah. Second time I'm like, this guy sucks. Yeah. Third time I'm like, am I you're a complete imbecile, go get a job. Why are you wasting your time? Yeah. And to realize like failure is not final. People are learning. Don't take failure as you know, the world would take it as you feel you're learning. You're learning the process. Um, to better take a next step. Um 
So yeah, I think that's a big component of, mm -hmm. of I kind of keep track of, I want to, I don't want to lose money or lose money, but I want to be exploring enough spaces that I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having some failures because I'm trying some new stuff. I mean, I want it to be cheap and right. I don't, I'd like not to necessarily lose, but to me, it's an evidence of, are you continually learning and, and understanding some fringe industries that may have some impact? Um, so to keep taking risks and, and have a little bit of failure along the way shows that you're, you're continuing to keep stepping, stepping out and learning. And I don't know, for me, I think that's a little bit of a, I'm starting to keep track a little bit of the losses and make sure that there's some of that rather than, yeah. Um, I don't know if that sounds right. But. No, I, you know, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing because it, we know it going back to sports, right? Like it, if you're always playing it safe, yeah. you know, you're actually never growing. You're never going to find out what you're capable of um, or what potential's in there if you're only making safe bets, right? Dude, it's, it's huge. I mean, literally the Jordan quote, I mean, I think back at the guys that are great, um, the Jordan quote is he's like, I'm the, I'm the best in basketball because, you know, I've missed 33 game winners. He's like, that alone is why I'm the greatest. And it, it tells you something like, you know, everybody in the league did not want the ball that many times with the game on the line. And, yeah. and he's great because he was okay with failing when everything was on the line. Yeah. And it tells you something about the psyche of you got to put your – you got to take that ball and risk some downside to get the game winner, right? And he Huge. had a lot of game winners, but he missed a lot of game winners too. Huge. They could have crushed him. And I think that gives some evidence to greatness in any space yeah. of, um, you know, it, it applies in business too. You, you have to, everyone looks back and sees the Uber or the Google <laughs> and they're like, dude, I mean, I'm still joking. Starbucks, if someone put the Starbucks business plan down and said, okay, here's the deal. You know, we're going to have this coffee brand that's going to sell you coffee for four bucks and you're making it home for 10 cents right, right now. And, and we believe the experience is going to be worth the three ninety more. It'd be like, that ain't working. It's become the most powerful brand in the world. Yeah. And so there's a component of, um, you, those brands never look like those brands when you need to invest to be able to say, Oh, I was the first investor in Starbucks. No one knew it was going to become that, but, you can't logically, you just, you got to invest and you got to trust some instinct and some initial gap, but you would never be all in you right. know, on a Starbucks that early because you just couldn't see the path. Yeah. So I think you have to put yourself in positions to make small bets, miss a little bit because you're going to have some misses, but you're going to have, you know, you, you may catch a couple and as you get more active in better circles, there's a component. I think the quality of deal flow gets a little better so that your hit rate gets stronger and you know vcs i mean sequoia those guys are hit rates are way stronger now because they've got an ecosystem that they plug companies into they pre launch you know they pre-cover their own exits before they invest it's you know their hit rate has improved a ton right you know with a lot of reps early on if i had a lot of misses 100 you know? you know i think one of the things that you're just hitting too and we can it, it, it's kind of a perfect segue and we can jump back into that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that a lot of your um, success and experience is in those areas that, that uh, are sexy, you know, like the restaurant space and, and real estate yeah. and film, but it's so, I think such a good um, message to our, to our audience of you can have success in those spaces, but um, you have to do the work. Right. Yeah. You, you have to know the business side of it. You have to understand risk. Um, and then I think just you talking about the mentality of, of understanding that failure is a good thing. That, right. And um, you're not cut out for this world if you think you're going to make money in every single deal. Right. And if you think you are, I think it's obviously just a being naive. Yeah. And then also, you know, people aren't being honest with you if right. they're not, not discussing risk. But you know, in our society, unfortunately, we've been taught to play it safe, right? Traditional education yeah. um, it does not want to push us out to take necessarily risk. Yeah. And, um, but for you, it's, this has been, you know, 
you transitioning into education, yeah. obviously being a dad yourself um, and, and launching new learning ventures. So uh, a private philanthropic venture capital fund that invests in educational entrepreneurs that are rethinking and reshaping education and act in academy. Talk to me about your passion for education, where you think it's going and what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm not an educator by any sort of stretch or passion about it. I think I've just been assessing, you're always thinking of talent, you know, and how do you invest in it? And this widening, it's almost like the future's heading here get the software programming that schools are inadvertently because i think just culturally education it's it's become boiling water i mean their their mission vision values on the wall would say yeah they want to aim at this but it's very much a software program for a linear future where i just i think our kids are going to need you know they need to wake up every day and say how do i add value and you know they're going to have to hustle they're going to have to think critically they're going to have to be really tough they're going to have to um the linear jobs are going away more so and i i, I have alarming concern because the typical educational feeders like go to a good school you know go to an ivy league and you're going to be good well, the reality is is i'm seeing big companies you know c-suite executives boots on the ground middle management's disappearing from the economy because these bloated companies can't contain it and sustain it. Uh, now you have international competition where, to be honest, they're hungrier and they're going to fight a lot more than a you know, Midwest white boy, you know, stereotypically. Yep. And it bodes better for a Pepsi to have an Indian CEO than it does to have a white American because diversity is playing well. So you have global competition with international competition, I'd say, being hungrier, not that they're smarter, but being hungrier than, you know, a, a spoiled American, yeah. you know, system of just, it's been good in America. Other people want the same opportunity. They're hungry for it and fewer jobs. So I'm literally like to say, I want my kid to go, you know, to Stanford and Harvard, get a great degree. And I know he's going to have a good job. Those guys are going out and realizing like, what they're paying for and the level of jobs they're getting is just the, it's becoming dislocated. They're coming out being like, I'm getting 50 grand a year. And <laughs> part of it is they're realizing like <laughs> those jobs are disappearing. So yeah. either take less or go create more value. And I just think, you know, the future economy is more 50% entrepreneurial, yeah. you know, the, the future job may be, it's going to be more knowing your unique strength and how you can add value for two or three companies. And you may have two or three clients and that's your job. It makes you 150, 200 grand a year, but you drive a lot of value that, you know, that kid's going to need to go win that business, you know, pitch why he, they need him, you know, hustle to keep it to, to have someone go put it in their lap is just not, the future and i think a little bit of just uh, sadly the the sense is that you know there's no soft skill development there's no uh fail no means for them to test things and fail so like acting as a children's business fair which is freaking awesome kids start a little business start a little project they can have many failures they're starting to really develop a sense of all the right inputs to uh, be a little hustler when they go out and they know should have a real clear sense of where they're strong and where they're weak. So massively self-aware and they know where they can drive value. Uh, so yeah, I've just kind of become passionate. I think, yeah, just via what I'm seeing in the world and the lack of talent. Right. Um, yeah. Great. So kind of stare is staying on that, that, education, learning, personal development. Yeah. You know, I think one of your, your projects we're most excited about is, is Tuck and Taylor. Yeah. Um, that, that's going to be, you know, launched here, hopefully kind of in the, the, the next six months yeah. to a year yeah. window. And, and, you know, tell me a little bit more about Tuck and Taylor and, you know, dive down into what is the culture and yeah. why is that so important of, 
of the culture you're trying to create with yeah. the people that are in there and, and the books and, yeah. and yeah. tell me how how you look at your own personal yeah. development and how Tuck and Taylor plays into that. Yeah. Well, personal development, I think everybody is a naturally in a, in a, you know, if you don't invest in yourself, you're a depreciating asset. So in every industry. So if you're not learning, you're like a building. It has a useful life to it, you know, and, you know, they'd say like 50% of the doctors that haven't been continually reading are making very inaccurate, you know, judgment calls on, you know, <laughs> diseases people are having because they're, they're, they're not up to speed on all the components. And I think everyone just knowing like every day you wake up and you don't invest in yourself yeah. and learn you're worth less, you know, than you were yesterday. And so just that sense of that depreciating asset, you know, a human has a pretty fast and I think it's accelerating. Right. You know, or maybe it's 20 years, you know, 10 years ago now it's 15 and it's going to be 10 and you got to stay in the front of your industry. So I think, right. um, Pouring into yourself. And so, yeah, Tuck and Taylor has just been, it's kind of a selfishly, you know, I, I, it's a great, cool mixed use project that I want in my office. And I think feel like I hate offices because, you know, they're I like being around people. And, and I'm like, okay, what I really want to be around, I love being around the brightest people possible because it's, it just, it, it elevates your game. And so then you think you're okay, what environment attracts, you know, the best people. And so it's a little bit more of, okay, if your goal is to, to generate fruit, do you focus on constructing the perfect seed or do you spend all your energy on getting the richest soil set? And so I think a lot of it is, Tuck and Taylor is a, a venture capital environment that, you know, um, it's just figuring out, okay, how do you get really rich soil? Because then whatever seed you drop in, it's going to feel fruit or it's a, you know, sunflower seed or an apple seed or corn or whatever, you're gonna, it's going to be fruitful. You know, it'd be like planting a seed in Arizona. It doesn't do much planting it in Iowa. It has a big <laughs> yield. Right. How do you, what are the inputs that create great cultural soil? And so I think that's kind of a case study that I really want to think through. Like, what, what does little things create an environment that um, things just happen? And I've been around enough talent to just see when the right people come around and you start posing bigger questions and you think, big and, and share ideas, things just start popping. And it's what, you know, Silicon Valley is a perfect example of a case study of, of what an ecosystem can do. And then you start having liquidity events and then there's more capital. And then is Silicon Valley, I think, is very you know, partner oriented, um, co-invest, very collaborative thinking. There's just a richness that um, Tuck and Taylor is just kind of a, a venture capital environment that I, I would love to see just in 20 years, just cool stuff comes from. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, one of the pieces in this leads into, you know, as we start to wrap up our time is, is we ask all of our guests a, a yeah. few specific questions, yeah. you know, that, that are, I think normal questions. The first one obviously always comes from, from Tim Ferriss, who I think uh, so many of us have, have learned so much from yeah. um, is, you know, what what book or books have you gifted yeah. the most um, in your own life uh, to other people, yeah. or you know, maybe it's it's the books that you hear right away. You go, yes, that's the book I would yeah. give someone just jumping into yeah. this this world. Yeah, well, I think um, you know, out, <laughs> outside of the Bible, uh, I mean, I know for me, I think your worldview is really important. So there is a component of I think you should ask the bigger questions on life, you know, mm -hmm. of, of you should be on a search for, you know, is this all a big accident? Did someone create it? Um, you know, if there is a creator, he's given us a manual. I think you're, if you acknowledge that we're not an accident then you're a dumbass, if you don't read the manual, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like pretty simple call it what it is. There's, yeah. that's huge because how you define that question plays into how you execute you know, your day to day. But outside of that, uh, Today Matters by John Maxwell was huge in just the sense of you can't be tomorrow what you don't do today. Mm -hmm. And I love that because, you know, he was like, I'll spend a, I can spend a day with anybody, take a cross section of a typical day, see how they're spending time, and I can predict where they're heading, you know, if they 
presume continue on the same, but that's how they spend their time and very predictive. And so that sense of like, how are things going take a cross section of how you're spending your time. You know, it's like, if I want to be a good dad, but you don't, you know, hang out with your kids or a good husband and you're not doing anything with your wife, you know, it's like two parallel lines are never going to yeah. cross. And so you're deceived by your own, you know, good intentions. And I think right. that, that's one thing I've just learned is there's the perpetual, I want to be healthy. I want to be this. I want to, and, and yet you can't be tomorrow, which you didn't do today. So that sense of, okay, I want that, but I didn't do it today. And then tomorrow I want that, but I didn't do it that day. And 40 years go by and yeah. you still want to be that person, but you've never become it. So today matter was huge. Uh, the compound effect was a really big one. I think just really seeing the, the compounding nature of small habits was, you know, super helpful, man. What uh, mastery was a really cool one. The New York times bestseller, I think it's by Robert Greene. Apprenticeship, it got to that kind of like seek out someone who's great. Like the world used to yeah, function sure. around like apprenticeship, which I think is obviously a big believer in. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that's uh, that's probably it I can think of right now. Great. Yeah. If you could give advice to a smart, driven athlete who is transitioning off the field yeah. into the real world, what would it be and why? Yeah. Um, I think just knowing that the, the um, people really, <laughs> it's kind of harsh, but people really don't care. I mean, there's just kind of reality. I remember a good friend of mine, his daughter was stressing out about like her hair going to school. And he was like, just really people don't care. Like really the girls at your school are so concerned with how they're looking. They're not even thinking about how your hair is looking. And they just make that connection. Like people are so inward oriented, like people don't wake up and think about you all the time. And when I played baseball, I kind of thought like it really, I didn't play free because I kind of thought like, Oh man, there's a lot writing on this, you know? <laughs> And just that sense of like, people like the idea of the athlete, mm -hmm. but know that, you know, I think when you're done, that next day you wake up, you feel like you're outside of a bubble looking in and you kind of realize like, oh, they liked me as a professional athlete, but me individually, you know, not so much because now they don't see the value in that role as much. Now it's just me. Right. And I think to just have a humility of, and I think in any space, if that's a CEO or anybody successful, is just you're going to be remembered like a hand in water. You pull it out, it goes back to its normal state. And to know, I think to have a, a humble realization that you know the world f forgets about even those that you know crush it. The, who, I hear the modern day LeBrons. I grew up with Jordan. The world freaking has forgotten about Jordan already. Yep which is mind blowing. I mean, I think back Jordan was like, and he's freaking struggling with that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you may, you'll be the best in your space and your the world forgets about you and doesn't really care about you. So just know that like, don't take that pressure off yourself and be true to who you are and wake up and be like, okay, what is it I really want to do? And how do I want to add value? And don't do it for the wrong reasons, you know, as you transition and, you know, those that are really blessed and rich in life wake up every day, do what they love. They have a joy and a satisfaction in the process. Um, that's what you want to kind of aim at. I mean, awesome. What is the best or worthwhile investment that you've made? And this could be definitely it could be money, but it could be time. It could be effort. Yeah. It's like, well, it's invest the best investments in yourself. You know, so I literally would say, like, read. I've always tried to, like, learn an hour a day, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what's cool is that could be an article, a podcast, a book. But just um, that you, you're, you know, what they say, like, reading is to the mind what exercising is for the body, you know? Like, it frames your attitude. It frames how you think. It keeps kind of that, you know, victorious you know, approach to the day of like strong, you know, um, 
positive thought rather than it's like something that you just notice when you don't like yeah. you just get in a little bit of your own little spiral. Uh, so always checking what you're letting in, but investing in yourself, I think would be the best. And, um, what, uh, yeah, what invest and probably think of invest, think of failures as like investments of learning and really look back <clears throat> on maybe really dark seasons of failure and try and pull. I feel like those returns sometimes can be stronger than the wins. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I struggled in a professional baseball career, but some of the key things I've pulled out of that have had so much incremental impact, not just financially, but, you know, like going through some horrible times I'll look back at, I'm like, I would have removed that in a heartbeat if I could have, but looking back and be like, man, that was like, the return on that season was a thousand fold. Right. You know, so to kind of almost reflect back and, you know, even contextually pull nuggets out of old life experiences too, that could be uncovered gems. Yeah, no, that's fantastic advice. I love that, that look at those failures as, inv as investments, you yeah. know, it's so good. What right now is filling that hour a day? Yeah. Where is there a certain podcast yeah. or book that you're, that yeah. you're into right now? Or No, so I love the Pocket app is legit because um, the way they source articles, super helpful so i love that you know technically speaking that um blinkus is a cool app um podcast how i built this that npr podcast is freaking off the charts yeah um and, and my big thing is like when you listen to lots of them the, the narratives are all common like started with a passion didn't quite know what i was doing but i just knew i had to do this you know it just, I love it. I mean, Starbucks, Spanx, you know, there's so many cool stories on that one. So I really love that. Um, um, reading a parenting, I got four boys, so I'm reading a parenting book right now, which I'm working on being <laughs> a more patient dad. <laughs> yeah, well, t talk about yeah. that, that a little bit and, and we're closing up yeah. on time, so I'll be respectful of it. But, Going back to the beginning of the interview, yeah. you said, you know, one of the things that you were drawn to early on of mentors when you were first yeah. getting into the space was, was people that had priorities, yeah. right? That it wasn't yeah. just about crushing it yeah. financially. Cause I think we've seen that, yeah. right? A, another, you know, organization that, that you've started in the Camelback Society. One of the things I love the yeah. most are our civic breakfasts. And for the listener, it's once a month, uh, individuals come in and, and, talk to a, a group of, of businessmen here in Phoenix that are trying to integrate their, their faith in their work and uh, to, to crush it uh, at home and in work. And, and they share their stories and how many times that we've heard the older successful gentlemen yeah. come back and say the same regrets yeah. that a lot of it is, you know, I wish I was a better dad. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to make up for it now. Yeah. I'm trying to do those things. So just being a dad of, of four boys, trying to be a good husband. Yeah. Um, obviously, here you are investing in reading a book. Yeah. How do you navigate that? You know, as you have more success, it kind of seems more opportunities yeah. available. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I think what's what's the the reality of what's discouraging is is you truly are what you love, um, mm -hmm. and if you love. Um, if you you can't fake it and so it's like if you love money that's your time your energy your effort you know it's going to go in one direction if you love pleasure and women it's going to manifest itself so it's kind of like this what's what's frustrating is when you 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 love your wife you love your kids for men, it's so easy to find your identity and work because it's a it's a measuring stick of validation. That's really we're real. We're, men are really insecure. It's like you have to like find. And so there's a component where that's healthy, and there's a component where that's not. Because I get frustrated when you're like, why am I not more energetic and you know yeah. creative with my time with my kids? When I'm just really you know, it's just checking a box. To, you know be present rather than actually adding value. And so I think it's just really 
wise to be always assessing, you know, to, to be aware if you, if you're massively insecure, it's going to show up in lots of ways. And, and what do you really love? You know, I mean, it's, I don't think it's a, it's a mystery why, um, you know, why people say the heart really, they used to think the mind, you could kind of hack the mind and you could, you could tell your body what to do. But at the end of the day, there's a reason you can't keep, you know, it's like eating. It's like there's a reason you can't because you, you love the pleasure of the food or the component. There's a component of like you can't hack it long term. So you really have to start asking bigger questions about, you know, why do I love this so much? Or why is this feeling such a void and is that healthy? And, you know, why do I work till seven o'clock every night? Do I really have to? Or is it like, man, I go home and the house is a mess and I feel like I'm fail. It's, I feel failure there. I feel successful at work. Well, yeah, you're going to want to hang out where you feel validation that it's working and you want to stay away from where it's, you know, the fire's blazing. So it's those really, those why questions I think are just always huge. Like, why am I spending so much time on this? Why is it so hard to, you know, break this habit? You know, why rather than just a habit for habit's sake, but ask, yeah. um, Why is it going on? Yeah. You know, it's a healthy question to always be asking. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it, uh, I think, so I'm done with my questions yeah. and, and, but is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have asked you anything that you want to kind of close out and leave the audience with? I think it's a beautiful uh, kind of ending right there yeah. is, is to drill down and, and discover, you know, we know, we know money doesn't bring that yeah. happiness. Yeah. You know, it, it's asking that big why question of what gets you up out of, out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Um, it, any, anything before we go? No, I think, uh, that was great. It was fun kind of thinking through that stuff <laughs> talking about it. Yeah, no, well, I really appreciate yeah, obviously the, the time and, and, uh, the time as well. and our friendship and, and I know our audience definitely will, will grab some, some yeah. nuggets out of that. Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Athlete CEO Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our show today and are ready to take action on the advice from today's episode. Our goal with the Athlete CEO Podcast is to make it the go-to resource for athletes and entrepreneurs looking to take their game to the next level. Love the show? You have any suggestions on how we can improve? We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, tweet, and share your thoughts. We do our best to read every single one. We'll see you next week with another world-class episode.